So um, can you use my screen, Lena? Yes, great. Okay, so I think we can start now. So welcome everyone, I'm Dahen Lee. I'm a research associate at the Department of European Planning Cultures, Faculty of Spatial Planning at Technical University of Dortmund. I'm happy to greet all of you here on behalf of the organizing team who are here today. Robin Chang from Aachen University, Patricia Fayetak and Lena Unga from Technical University of Dortmund. We will serve as moderators for sessions today and tomorrow, together with Nick Novara, our colleague in Dortmund. The symposium is a two-day event, so in a minute we will have a keynote lecture followed by sessions. Tomorrow we will begin with sessions and in the evening we will have a panel discussion. For the purpose of networking, we have planned social event, um, social time um, today from 7.30 and tomorrow from, eight, from about 8 p.m. Central um, Eastern time. So we created a social space at Wonder Me. And as you can see, we have different zones for different topics so that you can easily find people who share the research interests with you. So please join us. You can find the link now in the chat or you can find it also in the um, login details that I sent you last week. I'd like to use the opportunity to also advertise the thematic issue we organize in urban planning, which is an international peer-reviewed open access journal of urban studies. The title of the issue is co-production in the urban setting, fostering definitional and conceptual clarity through comparative research. So we look for contributions that attempt to sharpen understandings and definition of the concept of co-production by using comparative approaches. Not only the presenters, but also anyone interested can submit the abstract till January 2023. And after going through the review process, if accepted, your paper will be published in the beginning of 2024. So you can find more information on our website or you can directly go to the website of the journal. So you can now find the link in the chat. In case um, you have any questions or problems during the event, then please contact us at symposium.epc.fk09 at tu dortmund De. You can find the email address in the chat or in the symposium guide that I sent you last week. So, without further delay, I now introduce um, our keynote speaker, Angela Milio. She's professor of urban design and urban development at Technical University of Berlin where she's also director of the Institute of Urban and Regional Planning. She also serves as director of the DAAD Global Center of Spatial Methods for Urban Sustainability. Her research focuses on participatory urban design and Baukultur with a special interest in cities as educational settings, children and youth. Her most current research explores educational landscapes, neuro-urbanism, and the changing spatial knowledge and hybrid spatial constructions of young people. For many years, she's been pursuing a range of outreach activities with schools and youth groups and carrying out funded research on built environment, education, and youth participation in spatial design and urban planning. I'd like to highlight here that she is the founding member of Jugendarchitekturstadt e.V., a non-profit association dedicated to architecture and built environment education and participation of children and youth. 
Her talk today is titled Learning in Co-Production, Enhancing Translocal Urban um, Assemblages with Built Environment Education. So she will speak for about 30 minutes and then we will take questions from the audience. I will be moderating Q&A so you can post the questions during and after the lecture or you can use the raised hand emoji. So the keynote lecture will be recorded and uploaded to our website later. So please welcome Angela Million. We are so honored to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us and over to you. Okay, so let's get this lecture set up. First of all, also warm welcome to everybody on the screen. Warm welcome to my colleagues in Dortmund and Aachen. Um, let me see. Okay, and now. Do we have a full screen mode with you? Not yet. Not no. yet. Okay, how about now? Now it works. Okay, super. Okay. Good. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. I have to admit, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, oh, I would have liked to be actually in Dortmund because uh, what I'm talking today was pretty much inspired by me as a young researcher start, starting my work in build environment education at the TU Dortmund and um, one of the founding members, uh, Pai Vikataiko is still there, um, but most of us uh, that have been co-founding Jugendarchitekturstadt or Shodias have left the university now and have spread all over the country to take along something that has been forming in the field um, called build environment education. And um, I have to say that it is a development that has been around a while, but has uh, gotten intense more, like I, I would say, in the past decade, not only in Germany, but also in other countries worldwide. I will talk about that in a bit. And build a moment education sometimes and in some countries simply named architecture education, mainly for children and youth is dedicated on introducing and working with children in cities and landscapes and using them as a subject and context and reason for learning. There are a number of aims that come with these initiatives or with people that dedicate their work towards build environment education, which is, for example, or which are child-focused aims like broaden children experiences of the build environment, promote their exploration, uh, and also the development and use of creative skills and processes, but it also contains architectural focused aims like, yes, yeah, so to support multidisciplinary collaboration between professionals and children. And um, build a monument education, if you look at it, what it all contains, it very much also overlaps with other educational fields like cultural education or arts education, but also democratic or citizen education or education for sustainability. And being in that field myself, not only as a practitioner, but also uh, having the chance to carry out a number of research projects, um, uh, we stressed in the past 10 years over and over in some papers we wrote, but also in lectures we were giving on the work of build a mind ed education that we think that build a moment education can help to foster a higher quality in participation. Um, we 
our work itself, like coming back to the work of YAS, Jugendarchitektur's uh, Stadt, we very much uh, started pure educational, but after yeah, a few years, we were already asked by a lot of communities and other stakeholders to come in and do children and youth participation. So we experienced ourselves how it is if you take your methods out of build environment of B pedagogy, uh, to use the uh, abbreviation here, um, to use these methods also in part part uh, participatory processes. And we could see how with using these methods, um, young people and also children were much more prepared, feel much more confident in being part in even higher levels of more complex situation of participation, like um, shared decision making or even uh, initiating themselves uh, projects. Nevertheless, we also noticed, and actually we have become a little wary of stressing how much education can actually play a role in participation on the one hand, and on the other hand, how each participatory process stakeholders go through are also learning processes. This um, has not gained much attention, I would say, neither by practice nor in theory. Um, so that we got a little wary about um, talking about this and, and even me talking about this and until um, basically we really could see how even participation culture in Germany, I would say, came to its limits. Um, and if we look at the quantity of um, participation that is happening in Germany, we can see that it is pretty much applied by default and also beyond the legally prescribed framework by, uh, for example, of the Baugesetzbuch of our building code regulations. And if we see criticism of practice um, today, it usually relates less to quantity and more to the quality uh, the, of the participation practice that we can see at least in the German context. Um, and I'm quoting here, for example, uh, Klaus Selle, who said that already in 2013. And if we look since then, we can see that participation culture, at least uh, in the German context, but I also think beyond, uh, has seen uh, rise in, 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 in the diversity of players that are now part of such uh, participatory processes like citizen initiatives, NGOs, but also professional private providers in a very from with diverse backgrounds. Um, we can also see in the past years a uh, rise of digital communication. It is becoming more and more important in addition to other rather traditional formats of communication in participation. And we can truly trace the rise and the rising importance of co-production, um, which is happening aside to traditional participation. Um, and to shed uh, or to come back, for example, to young people, uh, we do have uh, uh, something that's called the Urban League. It's been installed um, a few years ago um, on the national level uh, and incorporates um, young actors that are operating themselves in this very complex field uh, of tensions between politics, administration and neighborhoods and also property owners. And these actors are in their late teens, I would say, up to mid twenties. Uh, they're actively involved locally and are brought together to build somehow a forum, a knowledge exchange forum to uh, also work as multipliers um, spreading their knowledge, pinpointing also certain topics that from their perspective, from the co-production uh, perspective of young people, play a role in the urban development uh, of cities. Nevertheless, um, 
we already could trace this duality of being or having a chance or being involved in planning versus do it yourself much earlier. Um, there have been in the uh, uh, starting around, uh, I think, 2005, a number of uh, model projects financed also on state level or national level uh, for young people to take charge or to be part in participatory processes. And I would say um, two kind of projects were actually financed traditional planning processes where um, mostly top-down city administration wanted to get young people involved um, into, for example, um, comprehensive land use planning or neighborhood concepts. And on the other hand, there was this set of projects which were much more driven from citizens, from youth advocates groups, a much more bottom up, which were a lot about doing it or do it yourself, what we would call maybe also today part of co-production. And if we could trace also the kind of or the level or scale these projects happens, then Do It Itself started a lot on the scale of, of, of buildings on the side of a plot um, and uh, public spaces uh, as, as topics uh, and places and spaces to be active. While when initiated, initiated by administration, um, of uh, to have uh, young people participating in uh, planning. It was a lot more on larger scales like cities and neighborhoods. And we could, uh, we, we were able to do an evaluation of these 55 projects. And uh, actually it, it was very um, transparent where these model projects succeeded and also where they failed. And we could see that especially the uh, projects that were, um, uh, were put into place uh, concerning participatory processes on city or neighborhood level had big obstacles, um, especially on city level, for example, we had no really successful model projects to be seen. And on the other hand, we could see in the interviews and talking to young people who were participating and or uh, doing projects, pushing new projects themselves, that the projects on micro scale uh, were often the starting point for some of them to be then able um, to much better participate in such complex issue like uh, landscape uh, or uh, future land use plan that with a perspective of 20 or 30 years for a whole city. So we could trace that young people do indeed learn a lot within these processes and which enables them to be part in um, more abstract or more sophisticated or more complex ways of uh, planning and designing cities. Nevertheless, um, we could still see up to today that learning remains a rather neglected or under theorized domain. Um, uh, Colin Mc McFarlane was one who stressed that for his field of geography. And seeing his writing, I can very much relate on what he says by that um, I think we are at least in practice very well aware of discussions around learning regions or learning cities. Uh, we know a lot uh, also based on literature and studies, um, for example, of Richard Florida's creative cities of knowledge, mobility and so on. But the linking of spatial transformation, participation or co-production with learning processes is still somewhat missing uh, or not forefront discussed. And this is um, also the, yeah, the focal point of my little introduction or lecture uh, for this symposium is to stress how learning plays a role in co-production. 
have the impression even a stronger role than it is has been or has had so far in discussions of participation. I do see common points where co-production and build environment education have a common ground or uh, have meeting points much more than I can see in discussions or in the relation discussed of participation and build environment education. And last but not least, I, I want to somehow also discuss the role of planners and architects as yeah as teachers uh, the educative role which is also of importance in co-production um if we look at some studies that um for front look at, at, at different cases of co-production we always find writings on how it is important that in, in these co-production processes we have complementary knowledge and skills that actors bring together, they bring together their resources um, and to somehow complement uh, each other. Nevertheless, it is also stressed by some studies how especially spatial transformation or aiming for spatial transformation, being in spatial transformation, in the setting of spatial transformation, this can lead to shifts in the roles actors have and these shifts can be seen as learning processes among actors. For example, uh, when citizens uh, turn from protesters more into entrepreneurial spatial developers themselves or administrators uh, turn into a more activist role, stretching, still being within, um, but stretching the framework of legal, legal possibilities. And uh, the study I'm quoting here was done in the German context. Nevertheless, if uh, we leave the German context and um, uh, look at the context of the Global South, it's very interesting how here um, Vanessa Watson, and I think this is a paper that's probably well known to some of you, is comparison, comparing co-production collaboration practices in planning and stresses how participation and co-production under conditions in which governments are either unwilling or unable to deliver land and services, um, how here co-production is of importance. And she herself describing the work of NGOs um, that are more into social movement initiated co-production processes in Czech or slum upgrading. Um, she is stressing that also here, and I think I see it's stressed a lot more overall in co-production processes, that local knowledge is the core or base for such processes, but also for the creation of learning exchange. I think a lot of us are very familiar with the discussion of, of knowledge in these processes, but knowledge itself, bringing it together, does not bring automatically learning. But when you really start being aware of different knowledge stocks and, and, and you actually really incorporate them, them into your own understanding, then learning happens. Um, Vanessa Watson talks about horizontal exchange she could trace in the cases she was looking at. For example, collective building of places and objectives was used, but also festivals and trips to share knowledge with other communities to really bring the knowledge to other places and to create, I would say, learning moments for communities, but also for authorities um, by going even beyond the settings, by moving between and beyond the sites people were actually working on. 
and um, she will talk about a horizontal exchange that happens here and horizontal learning exchange. But I also trace a vertical uh, learning exchange here. And she compares the situation with the work of Colin McFarlane. I was already citing at the beginning. Um, and he himself and also um, uh, Vanessa Watson, uh, citing him here, it talks about learning assemblages that are basically created here. Um, learning is produced not simply as a spatial category, output or resultant formation, but through doing performance and events, a communicative practice, I would say. And urban actors form and um, um, urban actors, forms, and also processes are defined overall less by the pre-given defini pre -given definition and more by an assemblage they enter and reconstitu reconstitute. And I can very much, um, and I think this goes very much in line uh, with the research and all the discussions we are doing in the Collaborative Research Center Reconfiguration of Spaces, where a spatial transformation is conceived as a process of communicative actions and social practices embedded in people's life. And co-production goes very much working with these everyday lives. And what people experience, want, believe, know, do, and how they interact in turn in in engenders new institution, novel forms of localization, interconnectedness, and spatial experiences. And we are discussing these aspects in our uh, open source book. And I think that's maybe also an interesting literature for you on spatial transformation. Um, Mac, uh, Farlane himself, not only talks about learning assemblage here, he talks also about translocal learning assemblage. And he is somehow stressing the last points, how the exchange of ideas, knowledge, practice, materials, and resources travel across sites, and how they have the capacity to exceed the connection between other groups and places and somewhat um, offer learning opportunities that or tra travel learning opportunities that go beyond the situation can even have a global exchange a national global exchange but also incorporating knowledge that is after all also um, learned or acquired in translocal situations and we can see this in our own study of uh, spatial capacities we find of, of young Angela, sorry to interrupt, but you're muted. Here we go. So how long am I muted? <laughs> For five seconds. Five seconds. OK, good to know. Um, uh, we can trace the trans locality of knowledge stock and also connections um, in our own study of the changing spatial knowledge of children and youth, um, doing a qualitative meta-analysis uh, from roughly the 1970s up to today. And we could say that, uh, and trace in the studies we were looking at, how children and young people are aware of and grasp spatial transformation in contrasting contexts, simply by their biographies of comparing their childhood, for example, here and there. Um, they can very much rely and remember on spatial changes, on physical changes that, that really also um, uh, enters their memory, comparing how their uh, physicality of the environment is now compared to before and they remember what they did when they were young at very young age and what they do today. They can 
On the other hand, ascribe meaning to spaces and uh, to a sense of belonging and identification. They have the ability to detect through the senses distinct and signify special traits and qualities. And they can take this in grasping, sizing opportunities to intervene. And I think we see that the spatial capacities are high on the level of children and youth and that they to come back to co-production are actually here again also experts and knowledge holders and that these spatial transformation processes and co-operations co um, and cooperative planning processes can indeed benefit from these spatial um, capacities. Um, common points between co-production and B. Um, to come to my second point is, and I'm going back to the paper of Vanessa Watson, where she is in the end comparing very roughly collaborative planning and co-production processes, pointing out the common points like state and society engagement, incremental and evolutionary uh, and social learning approaches you find, but dialogic and uh, also democratic practices of individual and individuals and collectives. But she also stresses that co-production is about going or using channels uh, outside and alongside of formal ones, uh, that it is more about implementation and management if you compare these processes on a regular basis. Um, especially in the uh, Global South, and, and she is drawing here explicitly on the practice of the Global South, but I also can see if I look at the co-production processes, even in Germany, I, I can see a lot of these aspects also um, playing a role, but we can see in the Global South power and conflict as a central issue much more, I would say. Um, Co-production uh, co processes are also about less talking, more doing and making. And uh, last but not least, an upscaling of local practices. And here she goes very much to the examples she was looking at in her paper. Nevertheless, I also see, and I've given the example of the urban, um, the urban forum, the um, uh, uh, of the young people in Germany, that we also see this upscaling of local practice by national no networks here. And now coming back to world environment education and looking at the work that is being done there by a lot of uh, educationalists um, that do this work, um, it I can see that the work is also still very much alongside and outside of formal education, of formal channels. Um, it is a lot about implementation, definitely less about talking and more doing and making. It also comes simply by the fact that if you work with young people, they're not too eager to talk a lot. If you see the image up there, uh, the, in this project, a, a road was closed down to do a workshop uh, one day on the street on future ideas of uh, public spaces in the neighborhood. And you can see how excited the young people are in this image sitting there being afraid that they have to talk. No, this was not the aim of the workshop. It was a lot more dynamic. Um, and in the end, uh, we used all kinds of met methodologies and methods to uh, work with young people, to uh, motivate them, to also uh, work with their knowledge, to come up with a product, an implementation, which was not about uh, really changing a plaza, um, uh, a public space, since this takes a lot more time and young people want to see results right away. But at least we came up with uh, um, a billboard campaign that was uh, shown all over uh, the city of Aachen and some postcards that were issues as giveaway um, uh, that were giveaways throughout the cities uh, showing images and situations how young people imagine public space to be used in that area where we walked off. So I can see um, and also looking at some of the um, uh, projects in place that claim to be 
um, co-production processes that indeed the ways of working and thinking are very much in line about what we believe um, build environment education can be and should be. So I can see that it would be a valuable discussion to see how here competences of build environment educa educationalists and people in practice and initiatives in practice, bottom up uh, initiatives in practice doing co-production processes, how we somehow can bring our expertise together. And last but not least, I have to stress that uh, build environment education is a worldwide uh, initiatives and is, is exchange is very vivid among practitioners. Um, for example, within the UIA Build Environment Education Network, uh, which has now, by the way, I think this is not up to date, uh, more than uh, 40 countries represented uh, in the network. Um, and everybody can be within the network, even without institutional background. Uh, we are somehow reaching, I think, a limit of uh, people, but we also find formats to foster this knowledge exchange uh, among us and to foster a learning. Last but not least, what is learned in build environment education? I learned, a, I, I talked a little bit how the um, um, co-production could be a setting for learning. Last but not least, we did a study to somehow find out how within build environment education young people learn. And first of all, we not only studied how uh, the moments of or the educational moments within institutionalized um, build environment uh, formats or build environment educational formats, but also how in everyday life young people learn uh, about um, space and um, the production of space. And, and we could see, of course, how in an institutional setting, they gain a lot of theoretical knowledge and knowledge about materials and also handling different tools. And uh, yes, we also could, tra tra could trace that taking part in build environment educational activities that they that it does change the perception of the environment of young people. Nevertheless, we could see that even beyond um, the, the sheer activity of building, designing something by yourself is an experience related, uh, much related to self-efficacy. Uh, and therefore very important um, to young people. They can recall in the memory, and you see here um, a sketch from an interview, uh, they can recall a diverse numbers of moments within their memory where they have been part of spatial production and even outside of official co-production processes. And I think this is also something to be aware of that of course, learning about spatial production not only happens within our educational offerings and co-production processes, but again, in everyday life, which leads us back to uh, Colin Mc Mc McFarlane's uh, idea of um, uh, urban learning uh, assemblage. And last but not least, um, I want uh, to stress uh, the aspect of uh, the role of build environment professionals and, and planners in these learning processes. If we really understand co-production processes as learning processes, I think it is stressed. And also I'm going back to Vanessa Watson here again, that um, by, an, but not only by her, but a number of scholars that within co-production processes, we need professionals that are less experts, but more providing in their work uh, to provide support. And, and here she is uh, citing uh, Acker and his colleague, um, to, to me, I think it describes very much the expectations of um, professional experts in such co-production processes to provide the right guidance without controlling, to ask the right question and rather providing the answers to assist community in finding answers themselves. 
and bring together physical and social aspects of the process. They need to play a teaching role. And if I see this quote, it remembers me of my task also uh, in university teaching, um, but also I think it remembers me on uh, the basis of what we think build environment education lists have to be. A colleague of mine and uh, me, we wrote a paper some years ago where we talked about the needs of educative planners and architects and um, and we could we could show and I think if you read these bullet points uh, coming from critical pedo ped pedagogy, Bilder von Freire's classical work, um, you you see by the wording itself, uh, how it very much relates on the quote of Acker uh, that uh, he think or what he thinks is necessary within co-production processes. And I think it's worthwhile to look uh, what on the other hand, Build Environment educationalists um, have been working on in the past years. And there are now out a few books and a few publications, but also project descriptions on the website of the UIA. And uh, I think I can also uh, for, uh, like shed light on this book. And I'm doing this uh, because also all of these materials are open access. This is also something that is within the roots of Build Environment Education that we try to make the knowledge on build environment education, open access for everybody to be used in diverse situation, be it in co-production processes or in pure educational settings. And I think this brings me to the very last point um, of my talk um, that I also, and um, Rosie Pandel and me, uh, in the end of our paper, we wanted to stress that um, there is no automatics. Um, educational aims um, do, of course, foster and stimulate learning to take place. However, it, it does not inevitably make it happen. Uh, means um, we, we, in the end, it's, it's a very subjective process that happens and we can only help to facilitate that. But to, to, to bring knowledge into meaning, which after all is learning, um, is a very subjective process uh, individuals have to go them, uh, through themselves. Um, and there is also a fine line, a very fine line to be aware of where um, educational approaches um, turn into citizenship training, co-optation, or even trying um, to bring paternalistic behavioral changes um, or turns into either or over eagerness. Um, and in the end, we are maybe too much of a teacher instead of, of, of actually listening and being a learner itself, which is important and a core point of um, co-production processes where we as professionals are also learners. And um, in the end, I think we need to discuss um, for our own profession, as, and here I'm speaking for planners and architects, uh, what do planners and architects need to be able to support learning in production and beyond? Um, what is the position of professional knowledge then in this context? I think this is still worth a discussion. And how might planners learn to teach? Thank you very much. Thank you so much for um, this wonderful talk. Um, it was really, really interesting. And um, I will now open it up for questions. I'm sure that we have many questions. So please post them in the chat. Um, Patricia will be monitoring the chat, or you can also raise hand, um, use the raise um, hand emoji, and then I will call on you. Yes, um, Sergio. 
Hello, amazing presentation. Uh, it was really, really nice to see all your work that you have been developing. Uh, I just have a really simple question regarding that. Uh, you were showing um, this participatory process for education with children, but have you noticed uh, that uh, there is a big gap between uh, when you try to teach about the urban environment with people that is older, like for example, elderly people than young people, there is a, a big gap between these two different groups of people or something that you, have you seen or can you uh, perceive <laughs> that you can share with us? Thank you. Yes, indeed. I mean, my focus was, I mean, if I look at the field of build environment education, right it, it's still developing i would say i mean it, it has not been around so long it's intensifying it's it's very much focused on children young people i think it's also focused on this group because there is some of the belief if you start early <laughs> you somehow can do so much more to be proven by research i think but on and i i do see the gap I, I see it uh, when it comes to adult education, although there are like a few people I know that really work with, 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 with older people or even elderly people that are interested in this process. But um, I mean, you could say we're taking the easy way right now. <laughs> um, I think like doing this work myself, I think the easiest it is to work with children. It gets much harder when you work with teenagers and young adults. Definitely, definitely much harder. Um, you really have to, to be really creative in your methods and approaches to, to gain their attention. Um, even in settings like the Global North, where they're not maybe are so much troubled by everyday hardships uh, compared to the Global South, it is hard to gain their attention. But uh, we are not reached, I cannot report right now, uh, much activities on the field of adult education. I do believe, and from own experience, that a lot of the meta method work that has been done works also with adults. Thank you so much. <laughs> Beth? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that was a fascinating talk. Um, I'm really struck by the focus on uh, educational processes and I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the institutional contexts within which this work takes place particularly I'm interested to know um, more about the German context and how universities and schools enable or constrain this kind of co-productive work. Mm -hmm. um... The settings in which built environment education happens right now is very diverse. It could be institutions like museums being engaged there, NGOs. It could be chambers of architects and local groups that do this, single persons. And um, of course, we are pressing, and I think the whole network is pressing to get more attention in schools. So schools are often reliable partners to reach children and, 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 and young people especially. I think here we have a tension right there because normally when you, when you move from participation or when you move from education into co-production and participation, I mean, the core value of participation is, and also of co-production is you do it freely. And here we go, we go with our activities into schools where we know no child and young people can escape us um, uh, when they work with us. So, so there is a tension. Nevertheless, uh, uh, schools are important partners, teachers there, but they do it on their voluntary base. So if you find a teacher that's interested in that field, Field, um, of build environment education, then you partner up with them and uh, we're trying to somehow weave this context, uh, uh, the content of build environment education in the curricular, using the curricular and finding the gap to weave it in. There are other countries like, like, like Finland, for example, that has that topic much forefront. Um, so if, if you look at these, and I think the, law, the, the international network is very valuable because we do have this constant change of where are you at in basically doing your build environment education practice, uh, how much are policies in, in responding or not, and how much really can you find a base in local education or in the school system. But schools are important um, as partners, 
but themselves, they are not so much pushing for it, I would say. There are only few teachers I know of in whole Germany that would push the topic from themselves. Um, the next would be Rudia. Um, hello, um, I'm Rudia Hapon, the Faculty of Special Planning here in, at TU Dortmund. Thank you very much for your very inspiring presentation. My question would be, um, what you explain, like, um, is really good, some kind of learning process for involving young people in planning process. But how could we move from learning process or exercise to like to have a spin off to the formal planning process? Are there like uh, the process here in Germany that take these uh, ideas uh, of young people into account in the formal process or is there any um, some kind of equal representations of young people in the formal planning process here. Yeah. Um, I think there are two questions. On the one hand, how do we get into a participatory process or co-production process that acknowledge that we don't know everything and that we can learn from each other? Um, and um, that that on the one hand we we have this knowledge available, but there may be gaps to be filled, um, or you basically model this knowledge to really something new where everybody gets a benefit out of it. In a sense, also take things away. And I think um, I think this discussion still has to be to be done. I I don't see this discussion really happening. I still see a lot of participatory processes and, and I'm more into participatory processes, as you see, I'm not using, saying so much the word of co-production yet, um, but I see a lot of participatory processes that simply ask, what do you want? These wish list participations. And I think that's not a good way to go about, especially I just had a master thesis that was looking at the blue green street remodeling project in Hamburg and the participation was done there, not even mentioning the aspect of blue-green infrastructure and the multitude of challenges the new design would have to face. They were simply asking for a wish list. And I think I can already sense the conflict by not discussing what it really means to, to, to create a blue-green infrastructure. Uh, and to, to, to deal with these conflicting issues of own needs versus climate change and climate adaption. And I think you, you really have to on a one, break down expert knowledge to a, a level people understand or want to understand on the one hand and take their everyday knowledge as a problem solving tool. And um, I think here, here I'm talking co-production right away. I'm aware of that. So I, I, I see there is still a gap when it comes to really seeing these processes as learning processes and asking yourself at what moment do I have to also ship in knowledge uh, or create a knowledge gain or how is it created? Sometimes we, we don't have to do anything. The knowledge gain is created. But the people bring the knowledge gain in their backpack with any additional process they enter in. And I think this is something to be aware of, to build upon that, to, to really uh, see what's happening. And on the other hand, your question was, uh, what does it mean um, to come, to give young people a real voice in participation and um, implementing? Um, I've seen d different, I seem everything of no voice where they asked young people to do wonderful models and pretty pictures and nothing was actually put into plans. Um, uh, but I also have seen some serious considering translating, or I would call it co-production processes of, of modeling results and putting them into implementation. And um, I, I do see, um, and it depends very much on the local community, on, on the certain, on, on the projects um, we're discussing, but I do see examples where this really happens. But uh, of course, I can name you 
X amount of project where participatory processes where nothing happens actually with these ideas, or at least it's not made transparent to children and young people what actually happened to their ideas. Thank you. The next would be Manuel. Yeah, thanks a lot from me as well for this really great presentation. Um, you kind of like already gave me the cue for what I wanted to ask. Um, talking about learning processes and the experts that are involved. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit more about those experts that are involved because you phrased that question, right? How can planners become teachers, but also how can they become learners or subjects that are willing and capable to learn? Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on how these learning processes work with those experts in the way that they also learn. <laughs> And what might have been some obstacles or, you know, either subjective or structural constraints, I would be really curious to see, um, to hear more about that. Yeah. Actually, you, you just found a wonderful research gap, I have to say. Yeah. So th there is not much research out there that I have come across where actually it is forefront discussed what are you as an expert taking out of, of these processes. Um, I think if I talk to uh, my colleagues in build environment education, if I talk also to architects and planners that are uh, doing these processes to actually design and plan, I'm meeting people who are really learning to be aware that, for example, uh, uh, a young child has a certain height and sees the city differently. And that from a certain perspective, um, uh, these needs uh, are differently. And that it's sometimes we need to go down on our knees to really understand what it means to have the perspective or the visuals of a young people. And then still, we are not able to fully understand. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a learning process where, where you basically get this awareness. Um, you also get somehow an understanding, or I think it starts with an understanding that you don't know everything. Um, and um, and you, you, you learn to listen and um, you learn to, to also value the, the things you're learning. And I'm, I'm not, I mean, just to give one example, I've been in, in a participatory process and I remember Bluetooth came along and now I sound very old. Uh, I know, but I had no idea what Bluetooth is. I had a smartphone, I, but I, I, for one of the first one, I did not know how to use it. And actually everything I know from my smartphone was in such a participatory process where we needed to fast uh, exchange images between the young people we were working with and, and us and, and we were hard, like breaking our head how to do this and they were teaching us technology. They were showing us how you actually could do it. So this is, is also something I think where young people uh, are sometimes forefront more knowledgeable, um, just to give an example. Um, but like I said, I think no study is known to me that really has looked at these value gains or knowledge gains we as professional get in such processes. I think um, it would have been good for me to write a, how do you say, a diary, like coming from each process and noting down what did I learn. So maybe this is also something to, um, to take into consideration when you do research in that field to be aware what you're learning basically as an expert here from such a process or within such a process. Um. Thank you. I think um, this was um, the last question and we are actually right on time. So um, thank you so much once again, Angela, and also for everyone for being here today. Now we will have a 15 minute break and after that we will start with four parallel sessions. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the symposium and I will see you around. Thank you. Bye.